Hello and welcome to the One O'Clock News. The headlines this Monday lunchtime. A solemn celebration. World leaders join members of the royal family for the state funeral of Queen Elizabeth II. We can all share the Queen's hope, which in life and death inspired her servant leadership a worldwide audience while in london hundreds of thousands lined the streets to bid a final farewell to the world's longest reigning monarch she's been a fantastic role model and, um, really quite <laughs> And over 40,000 patients left waiting more than 24 hours this year. Nurses say the figures are unacceptable. The funeral service for Queen Elizabeth II has taken place at Westminster Abbey. Over 2,000 people, including monarchs, members of the royal family and world dignitaries, were in attendance, including President Michael D. Higgins and the Taoiseach Micheál Martin. The state funeral was screened live in Britain and across the world. Around 500 dignitaries from around the world attended the service. President Michael D. Higgins was there representing Ireland. Taoiseach Micheál Martin represented the government. The guests included US President Joe Biden. There were European heads of state and monarchs. Also there were former British prime ministers with their partners, as well as Northern Ireland leaders from across the political divide. We come to this house of God, to a church where remembrance and hope are sacred duties. The service was conducted by the Dean of Westminster, who reminded the congregation that Westminster Abbey was where Queen Elizabeth was married and the scene of her coronation. British Prime Minister Liz Truss gave a reading. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. The Archbishop of Canterbury said that Queen Elizabeth's sense of duty came from her faith in God. People of loving service are rare in any walk of life. Leaders of loving service are still rarer. But in all cases, those who serve will be loved and remembered when those who cling to power and privileges are long forgotten. After the service, two minutes silence was observed across the United Kingdom. The coffin was hauled on a gun carriage by 98 Royal Navy ratings in a series of processions. The Queen's coffin will now be brought to Windsor Castle for burial. John Corain, RT News, Windsor. Well, let's go live to London now. David McCullough is at Buckingham Palace for us this lunchtime. David, a very solemn occasion, and I understand the cortege is due to pass Buckingham Palace there at any moment on the way to Windsor Castle. Yes, we're expecting the gun carriage bearing the uh, coffin of Queen Elizabeth, the late Queen Elizabeth, to pass us now. In fact, I think it is uh, just coming into view now uh, over on the other side of, of the roundabout there. And uh, the funeral cortege has been passing us for almost an hour now. Uh, delegations from different uh, regiments and different countries uh, passing by. The coffin will be taken to uh, Wellington Arch, where it will be transferred to the hearse for transfer to Windsor. But it has been a very moving uh, ceremony, whatever one thinks about 
that monarchy as an institution it has certainly been extremely well choreographed and the pageantry has been deeply impressive. All along the route uh, from Westminster Abbey to Buckingham Palace, people camped out overnight to get the best seats and I think they have uh, greeted the um, they have uh, greeted the service with uh, due dignity and solemnity. Uh, the radio audio of the service was uh, piped into loudspeakers. You couldn't hear a pin drop on the mall until after the singing of the national anthem when the crowd burst into applause. So it has been a very solemn, a very moving, a very impressive uh, display of, uh, of mourning and uh, I suppose celebration of the, of the Queen's life. All right, David McCullough, thank you. Well, today's funeral broadcast was watched by millions of people around the world. In London, as you heard, hundreds of thousands of people also lined the streets to bid farewell to the world's longest reigning monarch, many of whom had camped out overnight. You are the A mother and daughter were the last people to join the queue to see the Queen's coffin lying in state. So I feel sorry yeah, for them. They've been waiting as long as we have, so yeah. it's such a shame that they don't, they don't get that to. one you know, that one person in front, and that was it, sort of thing. Hundreds of thousands of people lined the streets of the capital to watch the funeral unfold, many having camped out overnight. It's a momentous day to say goodbye to her, and um, you know, she has a huge legacy. Um, and uh, I'm really pleased that we managed to get such a good spot as well. So, yeah, I'm hoping today will be a really a moving day. She's lived such a long life and done so much for us. She's been a fantastic role model. I feel this is the least I can do to say goodbye to the lady who has been an inspiring um, figure throughout my life. In every time when I am um, facing difficulties, I looked up to her. I felt, felt it was very important for me to bring my son here today to see the funeral of the longest reigning monarch. The Queen is also being remembered around the world from Hong Kong to Paris, where a metro station has been renamed Elizabeth II for the day. The funeral is being broadcast internationally and on big screens across the UK. In Belfast, hundreds of people gathered to watch the proceedings streamed live. Diane Connor, RT News. Well, our London correspondent John Kilrain is at Windsor Castle where the burial will take place. He's been updating us on the final journey of Queen Elizabeth this afternoon. Yes, the crowds are gathering here at Windsor. Um, they're laying flower, uh, flowers behind me there at the grass moat beside the walls of the castle. Um, during the week, people have been laying the flowers on what's called the Long Walk, but that's now closed off because that's where the actual procession will take place. Uh, when the Queen's hearse arrives here later um, and will be driven up into uh, Windsor Castle for burial. And John, take us through the sequence of events then um, when the cortege arrives at Windsor Castle. Well, the hearse is being driven. Um, it's going to take about two hours. They're, going, they're avoiding the motorways. They're going to drive through towns and villages to give people living in those places the chance to say goodbye. Uh, the hearse will be arriving here around 3.10pm. Around, uh, and then a committal service will take place um, in St. George's Chapel around 4 p.m. Now, the burial service itself won't take place until uh, later at 7.30 p.m. Um, and that's when um, the uh, mm. crown jewels, the imperial state crown, the orb and scepter will be taken off the coffin. And the Lord Chamberlain, the person who's in, in charge of the royal household and takes charge of ceremonial occasions, will break his wand of, of office across the coffin and it'll, uh, the Queen will then be buried in a vault beside her late husband, Prince Philip. Our London correspondent John Kilrain reporting there from Windsor Castle. In other news today, a HSE report for today's meeting of the Emergency Department Task Force shows there were almost 40,400 breaches of waiting times when patients were left waiting over 24 hours this year. The period covered is up to August. The Irish Nurses and Midwives Organisation has described the scale of the overcrowding as unacceptable. Well, right now, the acute hospitals are very overcrowded. That leads to really poor outcomes for patients. We know that if you're on a trolley, that your care is not optimal. Your, all of your private information is being discussed on a corridor. You might be getting bad news. Everybody around you hears that. That's completely inappropriate.
Well, let's get more on this now for health correspondent Fergal Bowers, who's here in studio. So, Fergal, how do these trolley waiting times compare with last year? Well, it's a 132% increase on last year, so the situation is deteriorating. Uh, this emergency department task force meets today for the first time since April. Um, HSE reported for the meeting says that there were almost 40,400 breaches of that 24-hour uh, period. Now, the HSE report says that on average, the daily trolley count between January and August this year, uh, there were about 316 people uh, on trolleys each day. The INMO figure would be much higher, as we know. And the hospitals with the highest number of patients on a daily basis on trolleys are Galway University Hospital, St Vincent's University Hospital here in Dublin and also Cork University Hospital. And Fergal, the meeting is also going to look at projections for flu outbreaks and outbreaks of COVID-19 over the winter months. What can we expect from that? Well, uh, today's meeting will discuss a draft HSE winter plan uh, and it models a number of potential scenarios coming over the winter period. It's a six month period that we have for winter for influenza and COVID-19. And for the six months of the winter season, it says a high flu season could see 4,350 hospitalizations with 225 patients in ICU. And I, I suppose a worst case scenario for COVID-19 would see 17,000 hospitalizations uh, with 700 patients in ICU over that six month winter period but no one, no one quite knows what's going to happen but they have seen a very bad influenza season in, in Australia and whatever happens there tends to come to Europe Alright Fergal Barris, thank you a review of energy security has outlined options for government to mitigate risks to both natural gas and energy supplies. The independent review, which will be published later today, looked at increasing imported energy and it examined ways of storing gas. Among the options being presented are a state-owned facility to store gas from the grid and a floating liquefied natural gas unit. Well, let's get more from our political correspondent, Paul Cunningham, who joins us now. So, Paul, what's involved in this review and what can we expect to emerge from it? I think the first thing to say is that this is a review which has got an intermediate focus. What's going to happen up to the year 2030? Not the particular energy crisis that we're in right now. So it's a longer term thing rather than the immediate short term. That's being worked out elsewhere. I think what the report is trying to do is to examine what are the long term trends, what are the long term risks when it comes to security of supply and therefore what can be done about it. And within that, it's going to abide by the climate plans that the government has already sort of worked on. So that's going to determine the criteria under which any um, new policy is going to emerge. Is it about sort of lowering the amount of fossil fuels we use? Is it about increasing the type of renewables which we've heard so much about? So one would expect to see lots of things in relation to wind. We'd expect lots of things to do with um, new technologies like green hydrogen. We'd expect to hear lots of things about um, what it can do. I suppose the big focus that people can have is that we will still be reliant on gas. We will still be reliant on that, even though we're increasing our renewables for a number of years. So it's going to be a dynamic setup. And one of the things is liquid national gas LNG. As you mentioned in the introduction there, Eileen, um, it does talk about the possibility of a, a, sort of a mobile um, station. What it doesn't talk about is an anchored station on land. That would seem to indicate that there's marks against the LNG plant at Shannon, which has been quite controversial. But the other things to say is we're at the very beginning of this. This is only opening up to a public consultation, so everyone can have a word up to the end of October. And then they're expecting policy decisions towards the end of the year with implementation starting Starting next year. So I guess it's an invitation to people who are interested. Now is the time where you can have your input into what government strategy is going to be. OK, Paul Cunningham, thank you. Ukraine's nuclear energy agency has accused Moscow's troops of an attack on the country's second largest nuclear plant in the south. The attack has not been independently confirmed, although footage was posted online by the Ukrainian military, which said a missile landed 300 metres from the plant. It comes as Ukrainian forces have launched counteroffensives in the south as well as the northeast. Back home, an investigation is underway into what caused a microglider aircraft to crash in County Clare yesterday evening, in which one man died. Inspectors from the Air Accident Investigation Unit are due to visit the scene of the crash today as part of an initial assessment about the cause of the accident. This accident happened shortly before five o'clock yesterday evening. A micro-powered single occupant hang glider piloted by a local man 
crashed in a field outside the town of Milltown Malbay. Emergency services including the Gardaí, ambulance personnel and fire and rescue crews from nearby Enestimon were alerted to the incident and travelled quickly to the area. However, the pilot of the microlight aircraft was pronounced dead at the scene. The Air Accident Investigation Unit, which investigates such serious incidents, was informed and the scene was preserved by Gardaí. The AAIU confirmed this lunchtime that they've deployed a team of two inspectors to the site who will carry out a survey of the accident area and an initial technical examination of the powered hang glider, as well as conducting interviews with any witnesses to the incident. The powered craft will then be moved to the AAIU wreckage examination facility at Gormanston in County Meath for a more in-depth examination for the purposes of preparing a report into their findings. The dead man was a well-known local tradesperson who lived in the area. Cathy Halloran, RTE News, County Clare. A serving prison officer has appeared in court charged with possession of drugs at her home in Dublin and possession with intent to supply. 38-year-old Marta Saipara from Saggart Hill Mews in Saggart in County Dublin was remanded in custody to appear again next week. A serving prison officer... Marta Sapara was brought to Tala District Court this morning with her co-accused, Mataus Kilkowski, charged with two drugs offences. The 37-year-old who worked in the prisoner escort service is accused of possession of cannabis at her home in Sagart Hill Mews in Sagart last Saturday and possession of cannabis with intent to supply. The court was told that cannabis with an alleged value of €144,000 was found when the address was searched over the weekend by officers from the Tala Drugs Unit. Garda Michael Brislane gave evidence that he arrested Martha Sapara at 12.22 on Saturday the 17th of September and when she was subsequently charged with the drugs offences, she made no reply. Judge Patricia McNamara said these were serious allegations but stressed that Miss Sapara was innocent until proven guilty. There was no guard that objection to bail on condition of her own bond of €1,000 that she live at the address in Sagart, sign on at Talagarda station three times a week, remain contactable 24 hours a day and, having already surrendered her passport, undertake not to apply for any new travel documents. Guard the Brislane said he was satisfied that Miss Sapara would turn up for court. Her 28-year-old co-accused, Mataus Kilkowski, was also granted bail on these same conditions. And while he was remanded on bail, Marta Supara must also make a cash lodgement of €1,000 and was remanded in custody until that money is lodged. Marta Supara did not apply for free legal aid, but her co-accused, Mataus Kilkowski's application for it was granted. Judge Patricia McNamara remanded her in custody to appear again at the Dublin District Court this day week while Mr Kilkowski was remanded on bail to appear again in December. Paul Reynolds, RTE News, Tala District Court. Now still to come on the lunchtime news, further disruption for Aer Lingus passengers as a new technical glitch causes delays to check in.